Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Marcus Jones with Entertainment Weekly, and welcome to our Awardist History Makers panel with Shaka King, writer-director of Judas and the Black Messiah, Susan Laurie Parks, writer of The United States versus Billie Holiday, Kemp Powers, writer of One Night in Miami and Soul, and Ruben Santiago Hudson, writer of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. How's everybody doing? Happy Ooh, to be good. here, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> happy to see my beautiful brothers also. Well, and my sister. Happy to you see know. you. Good to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh. It's nice to see you all as well. Um, I want to note a couple things before we start. Congratulations to you all. I believe you all had films that won a Golden Globe this year. Um, and the other thing I want to note is we are filming this in March. So Black History is more than one month, and I'm excited to talk to you about all the stories that you guys shared through film. Thinking about uh, specifically this award season and looking at uh, the film year that it's celebrating, did 2020 feel like a remarkable change to you? Like, did the events of last summer with the nation protesting the killings of Black Americans like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor have not just audiences look at your projects with more immediacy and reverence, but have you all uh, looked at your projects in a different light? We, everyone here, we've been telling the truth since jump, this crowd, you know what I'm saying? So we don't, you know, I, I personally appreciate that now perhaps the entire world is more able to hear what we've been saying. Right. Well, well, listen. Right, right, right. There you go. You know, it's, it's listen, the, you know, Gil Scott Heron said the revolution will not be televised. Like we've been revolutionaries. I, I was, well, I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else because that, that's not fair. But I've been saying what I've been saying and telling the stories and celebrating the people whose shoulders I stand on since I, I found out that it was some power in art. When I mm -hmm. found out it was power and power in art, I knew that that then, okay, let me take this vehicle and, and, and make a change. And um, so, I, you know, the difference is in them, not us. Right, That's right. the best I can put it. Right. I mean, I was on another panel and it was the same exact question. People are like, where'd you come from? I'm like, I've been doing what I've been doing for years. It's just no one gave a shit until this year. So, I, I mean, these are the stories that I enjoy telling. Um, right. It's it's mm -hmm. always been trying to give voice to characters that I recognize, characters that I feel represent me and represent my community. Um, and and as we all know, Hollywood is a business, and there's it's sometimes they see it as a they see a, a market for for the stories you want to tell, and other times they don't. I guess my my hope this this year for me has been honestly pretty extraordinary because as we all know, usually at the end of any given year, there's only one black film that people have had a chance to see. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's been an interesting side effect of COVID that uh, I firmly believe that anyone who's seen One Night in Miami, there's no way if they were interested enough to see that film that they didn't also see Judas and also see Ma Rainey and aren't also watching U.S. versus Billy Holiday right now. And that's pretty, and, and also saw the five bloods, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's, a, that's a big, that's the biggest element of this that's a change to me is that I, I'm, I, it's exciting for me to see my work viewed holistically within the context of all these other great works that have come out in the same year. Right, yeah. Um, I have a question, I have a question. I mean, do you think it changes us though to, when you're, when you're speaking and someone's actually listening. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, when we're just talking and not many people listen and people don't give a shit, that's one kind of reception we're having. But when we're actually now, it feels like we're being heard, mm -hmm. which is a change, which is a change. You, you know, it's kind of what, whether we're being heard or not, it, 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 will, it, will, it will reveal itself in the next few years. There's a lot of talking yeah, going on. Exactly. It's a <laughs> yeah. lot of yapping. And, mm -hmm. um, but hey, anyway, I haven't heard from my brother Shaka King. Congratulations, man. Yeah. Wonderful, uh, wonderful thank work. you. No, no, you, I think you just nailed it. Cause as I was thinking about it all, I was, I've, I've, you know, I wonder if people are listening or I wonder sometimes if, like I've heard all of our movies described as civil rights movies and I'm like, my ready to take place during the depression. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it's just like, I wonder sometimes how much people are listening or if it's like, I went to this, I went to a school that was largely white and in eighth grade, they let in like three black students, my friends, Al, E and Sean. And I remember for a few months, kids would just call them Ali Sean 
because they didn't bother, they didn't want to bother learning their, their names, mm -hmm. which are very simple, one syllable names, <laughs> right. you know? Uh, and so sometimes I wonder if that is sometimes happening with our, with our films. If they're not looking at, if they're not really, just like zone, honing in and really paying attention because I think each film is very specific and has a very specific thing that it's saying and focusing on. And there's so much to be, there's so much to be gleaned from, I think, looking at this work as, as almost like a, a canon in one year, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's all very specific and, and, and relevant in its own way. So I just hope that, I hope that people are really just looking at them all in that way, you know? Like that with that specificity and, and just that level of attention that they give, that they give, you know, that they say they give all movies. Right, yeah. Oh, I, uh, I think beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> you, said you said that's never gonna happen? Well, well, right. I guess when I said we're being heard, I was being uh, generous and provocative. I love it. We're being, we're <laughs> being invite, you know, we're, uh, our stuff is being streamed. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah, that's why I say, does it change the way? Yeah, I was, I was being very, uh, a little bit of an instigator there of some, some I, I I, a... <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't. No, I know, I know you. You, you yeah, know, it's you know like, I, 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 right. I asked her, I asked, and that's why I jumped right on it. I said, well, she wanted me to get in. I, she gave me in, but, but I asked the head of this uh, studio and I said, so with all this incredible work, you know, all this incredible work coming out of telling stories that where, where black people are in the center of the world or center, center of the narrative, how does that change uh, what you green light next? And he said, business as usual. I mean, we, we got to do, we got to do what we've been doing. I mean, and I'm like, so that means, you know, go back to, you know, you can spank people long as you want. They just get thicker pants. You, you what, I want to ask this question. And this is the provocative question. What mm -hmm. if all these films were coming out of a black production company and studio? I mean, it's even more. We, this is who you have here, yeah. but we still have oh, and Malcolm and Marie and, 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 and uh, my man's film coming from England. And it's like, it's like, Wow, you know, billions and billions of dollars. That's, I, I, I'm just sad I won't be living if it ever comes to, to fruition, that would be. Well, I mean, I think uh, mm. that brings up an yeah. interesting point, uh, bringing it over to Shaka. What was it like having a uh, macro, which I would say is probably the closest to that, uh, really help shepherd this project? I think it's an, it was integral because there was never any discussion around the politics of the film uh, from a creative standpoint at no point. Um, and I think because it didn't happen on the producerial level, it didn't happen on the studio level either. And I think what also contributed to that, I have to imagine, was the fact that, you know, we had in Nigel Kuykendall, an executive who's black at a, you know, I think she's one of, if not the only, um, black executive at her level within a studio within the studio system maybe she's one of one of, if, she, if she's not the only she's like one of two or three mm -hmm. um and you know I, I think it's no surprise that that was the studio that said yes to our movie you know right. so as Ruben is alluding to I, I think it's not just even a matter of you know the financials going into black pockets because that, that, that ultimately doesn't really move the needle but I think it speaks largely to just the ability for us to put forth material without having to explain it. Ex explain it. Not not even filter or censor. Just merely explain it. Just the act of explaining <laughs> it is is is, en is enough to. I'd love to avoid. And thankfully, and yet, was able to this time. You know. I'm sorry, but yet, man, there is no black mono thought. I mean, I have had to explain explain stories to my black stories to other folks in our tribe. So, I mean, I, I sure. wish that black, you know, would solve all the problems, but sometimes it gets you in a whole bunch of other problems because some folks look like you, but they work for the man. So how you figure we're gonna get through that? Oof. Brotherhood. I, 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 I broached that crazy, that, that idea because oh. studio wise, you know, just all of that that revenue uh, 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 recirculating, if it would, 
we don't know in that community to, to finance and to, to facilitate more of these stories. Is this a moment? Is this a moment? Because, you know, see, I, you know, I had a great uh, 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 black producer in Denzel Washington and he didn't have to answer anybody. You know, so I never had to explain anything to him, but so many times I'm doing my work and I got to go up to an office and explain what, I, what I'm doing. What, what did that mean, Ruben and Jitney, when all the hands went over his head and the, when, when his father died? It's the, it's the laying on of hands. It's a black thing that we do in, mm -hmm. in the sanctified church and in Africa. And mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It, anyway, what's your next question, Mark? Because I don't want to take this. Well, what's funny is that we got all the way into it. These kinds of questions were like, <laughs> I was saving for the end. Uh, so to all the way backtrack, and this is a simple question, but I think it's very valuable, uh, this being a screenwriting panel. Uh, how did you all get involved with your projects? Because each story is different between adaptation. I'd like to start with you, Kemp, because here you're adapting yourself with One Night in Miami. Yeah, I mean, mine is the boring version. I, <laughs> I, no, no one wanted to produce my play, so I adapted it into a movie because the, the reality of it is for me at least I found is um, if, if Hollywood is not very inclusive then man when people take a sharp lens to live theater I mean there, there are walls there that I just I still have not figured out how to to get around them just to right. be honest um, you know both Ruben and and Susan have exponentially so much more success and experience on stage than I probably ever will have. So I'm, to be perfectly honest, I'm still trying to find um, a way to get my my stage work out to, to an audience. And it's just through pure dumb luck that um, my, the thing that I think I'm pretty good at, which is, you know, character and the way that I write transferred well enough into film and television that I, that I, that I believe, believe I became a competent enough screenwriter that I was able to adapt my own work because there was interest <clears throat> in adapting the play years ago when it first was mm -hmm. staged. And I, I, was, I said no to everyone because I honestly didn't trust what Hollywood would do to that story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I knew the kinds of notes that I was getting to, from people who said, oh, I think this would make a, film, a great film if you did these things. And the things that they would often suggest kind of defeated the point. Right. <laughs> it showed that they didn't understand the theme of the play and they didn't understand the central themes that I would want to preserve in a film. So I just got to a point where I, I believed I was good enough at, at my craft uh, and that craft being screenwriting that, that I was able to convince, you know, the producers to, um, in addition to optioning the play, giving me a shot at adapting the screenplay myself. And it right. worked out pretty well for me. Certainly. Oh, um, anyone else? I'm especially interested, you, Shaka, too, you are uh, rewriting the screenplay a little bit, right? Because the Lucas Brothers had approached you with the script? No, what happened is the Lucas Brothers had a, an outline okay. uh, that was about like a page or two. Uh, mm -hmm. And they had a pitch, which was, you know, they envisioned a movie about Fred Hampton and William O'Neill that they described as The Departed in the world of COINTELPRO. Um, and so they brought me that pitch, they brought me that two page outline and then we beefed it up uh, to like somewhere like between seven and 10 pages. And simultaneously, Will Burson uh, was writing a Fred Hampton, had written rather a Fred Hampton biopic that he was trying to attach a director to. And we got caught wind of that project and decided to team up and myself and Will wrote a version uh, of the Lucas Brothers pitch. So we wrote this screenplay over the course of like six months to get a draft and then, you know, developed and developed and developed it. Right. I meant to ask too, when you say, cause you said this before, when you mentioned teaming up, did you all know each other before? No, so I was friends with the Lucas Brothers which is why they reached out to me. Okay. Um, but then we have a, my, myself and the Lucas Brothers and Will have a friend in common named Jermaine Fowler, who's an actor, who's a, he plays Mark Clark in our movie. And he was the conduit who introduced, you know, our grouping and Will together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious, just because usually writers who don't know each other, who all have the same idea, don't usually end up teaming up in, in such a symbiotic way. So I was just kind of like- I, I think it was because I, like the Lucas brothers never, I don't think they really ever intended to write the screenplay. 
Okay. They were bringing me on board to basically write the screenplay. Okay. And nice. I, as a writer director, would much rather write with someone else. And so I think uh, most of the time it's another writer saying, whoa, someone has a script like mine. I don't want anything to do with it. And I was, I did, I won't lie. Like there was a moment where I was in that mode because I was in the writing mode. But then the director and he was like, I, I don't want to wait a year while I take a year to write this draft. I want to be able to start really shaping this in two months time. Right. And so when I read a script that I thought I could tell this guy's a good writer, you know, and he's done the research, like we should, we should partner up. Um, and it was a great decision, I think. Yeah, that's dope. So this next question will go first to Susan, Laurie, and Ruben. Uh, what's, what was the research project process, excuse me, what was the research process and when do you feel like uh, you'd done enough? Uh, and I think it's interesting, you, Susan Laurie, uh, in reference to Billie Holiday being uh, the center of your story, but also you, Ruben, with uh, Ma Rainey's, there's two historical figures you're dealing with, uh, Ma Rainey, and then of course, August Wilson, the playwright himself, uh, reckoning with uh, that legacy of the play and sort of what he was thinking about and making it as a part of his Pittsburgh cycle. Mm -hmm. You want me to go? Oh, uh, yeah. Research. Yeah. I, just to, to, and, and to answer a little bit of your, your last question, um, there was a, a, an essay, um, Chasing the Scream, uh, a book by Johan Hari, Chasing the Scream. And it was brought to me by Mark Baumbach, who is a fabulous writer and producer, and uh, Jeff Kirschenbaum. And they, it, it basically told the story of how the, uh, the United States government went after Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. And I had known a version of this from when I was a kid. Cause you know how you, you guys, you know, our parents, you know, they play the vinyl, you know, and my mom would always play me that Billie, those Billie Holiday songs and you could hear the pain in her voice. And, you, and I was just a little girl, but me and my mom, you know, the mothers lean into their children and say, you know, they got to her, that kind of thing. And I was like, what does she mean? Um, and then we grow up to realize that in this country, you know, um, black excellence is often rewarded with persecution. It made perfect sense to me that the United States would have gone after Billie Holiday for singing Strange Fruit. Um, I did a mountain of research, you know, Johan Hari's uh, materials were lovely, but I did a mountain of research and, uh, you know, you have to immerse yourself in the music, you know, uh, those of us who are writing about folks who make music, um, you have to immerse yourself in, in this, the system, Harry Anslinger, you know, so I did a ton, ton of research. Um, and uh, the, the truth of her story was so clear. Um, the truth that the, that the government would persecute her for singing Strange Fruit, which opened our eyes up to uh, the lynching of black people in this country. Um, mm -hmm. And they had to suppress that in any way they could and that they chose to attach themselves to her drug habit and to bring her down that way. They always find something on us um, because we're human, you know? So they're gonna find something on us and they're gonna pull us down that way. And that's how they chose to pull her down when other people uh, were using drugs and not being persecuted. Right. Um, it's cool that we're all dealing with historical legacies too, but I, anyway, Ruben, but it's your turn to answer the question. No, I was, I just, I, you know, in, in, enthralled by just listening to, you know, you have to do research or, or particularly when you're dealing with something that really happened because, I, you know, Hollywood is looking for an exciting story and they, and they think it, it, that you have to embellish it, but they're great. The lives of these people are great lives, worthy of storytelling, worthy of huge, mm -hmm incredible uh, uh, um, stories. Mm -hmm. And so like when you do a movie about uh, like a Miles Davis or somebody, you don't have to embellish anything. His, Ma Rainey's life was so fascinating. All you have to do is find out, find mm -hmm. out and figure out mm -hmm. how it lays out. <clears throat> I wrote a movie called Lackawanna Blues about my mother. Everything in it is true. Mm -hmm. I laid it out differently, mm -hmm. but it's not a line in there. Maybe one or two lines that I just say, okay, I got to connect this, got any connective tissue. And so with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, the, the I'm with Susan Laurie, you know, I got to listen to the music, but I only didn't listen to Ma. There were dozens of women who were singing 
the blues at that time, Victoria Spivey, Clara Smith, yeah. Bessie Smith. I mean, it goes on. And, and by the time I got to like 70 different women that I had never heard of, mm -hmm. just I was just mining music, mining music. <clears throat> and then I, you take this, this masterpiece work, I consider masterpiece August Wilson's work, and how do I honor it? Not, mm -hmm. and how do I manage, he did the brilliance. He put the story together. It was a fictional story about a, a real person. So, so how do, do I take in, in, in elaborate on thoughts that he had in the play that he didn't get an opportunity to elaborate on, like my mm -hmm. beginning and my end? There are things that he mentioned that I, because of the power and magnitude of film that I made, I made visible, I made clear, not, not innuendo, not ambiguous, clear. This is what they're doing. Man mm -hmm. asked a question early in the movie, that trumpet player, is he gonna be here? And in the play, you forget about that. In the movie, I didn't let you forget about why he asked that question. Right. So these are the things that, that and because I have a Denzel Washington and a George C. Wolf working with me, I can fight that fight and not seem like a passionate, angry black man in the room when I start talking about things that were important to August, things that August brought up, things, the discussions we had. You know, I, I didn't have much of a fight, I didn't have to explain it. You know, we trying to figure out, well, okay, but I want this movie to be this long. So we're taking a two and a half hour play, two hours 40, when I directed it, 2.40 within the mission. So, how do I put that out of my mind? Tell the same stories, tell us, sing the same songs so I don't miss a phrase and keep the melody. And that's what I was doing, connecting, mm -hmm. connecting. And because I know the music of his language intimately and the plays very closely, and I understood the man, then I can connect it. Because if you're gonna, you're gonna sing my girl, you can't say my girl, my girl, it's, it's another my girl. Right. You know, so, so that's the way I have to connect August's work, the way his rhythms flow. And, 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 you know, but you have to do research or unless you're just coming up with something in your mind and say, you know, listen, you, you know, uh, as some people say, once upon a time and how I would say, man, you ain't gonna believe this shit. Right. And that's yeah. how you start that play. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of you, why tell stories that are more a moment in time rather than say cradle to the grave pictures? Uh, that's been a general trend with uh, biopics in general. But I think the question comes with the idea that many of these figures' stories have been underserved. Even if you get a chance to tell a cradle to grave picture, like right now I'm show running Genius Aretha Franklin. Right. And we wrap, we, we, we button it up yesterday um, and nice. we premiere in March, right? So, it, but even if you have a chance, it's still a, a thing about you want to focus on what is the most impactful moment? I mean, that's good. I, I feel like that's good writing. That's good directing. You want to focus on the most meaningful moment of the day, of the scene, of the, you know, that's just, that's just high, great writing. Um, mm. You know, instead of just doing the cradle, I mean, it, cradle to grave is, <laughs> we're all doing that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're all doing that. So if we can select moments that are impactful, I think it best serves the story. And again, yeah, these people's lives are undertold. Um, right. And what you, you know, you got to figure out as a writer, I always ask myself, what story am I telling? Mm -hmm. and what do I need to tell it? You don't mm -hmm. need everything to tell it. Mm -hmm. If you figure out what story you're telling, that's the first question I ask myself as a writer mm -hmm. to all the writers that might listen to this. If you don't mm -hmm. ask yourself that, if you're just writing, you know, then do a book of poetry. You know, you can talk about a lot of segments about a lot of things and, and, and nothing wrong with a book of poetry. But if you're going to write a movie, a story, a play, what play are you writing? And why? And to who? And for what? You know, so then you have some direction. Right. right. Um, I want to direct this to, to you, Shaka, thinking about sort of the conversation around your film and uh, how people are uh, a little bit starving for a Fred Hampton story that's like specifically mm -hmm. Fred Hampton and how your movie really departs from that. He is a major figure in the film but it's not necessarily his life story. Well, I mean, in, in our case, that was initially born out of necessity mm -hmm. um, in the sense of, you know, in Hollywood, Fred Hampton didn't have the name recognition to where we could tell, make a traditional Fred Hampton biopic. Um, nor do I think his politics lent itself to the studio just being super excited about making a Fred Hampton biopic mm -hmm. traditionally. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the, the genius for me in, in terms of Lucas Brothers pitch. I could see how we could get 
information and history out there uh, in a way where otherwise we, we just wouldn't have that option. Um, and I like to, you know, as a dramatist, I like to, I like the sport of that too. Like, oh, yeah, let's play, let's, you know, that's, there's some fun in that, right. um, you know, so that excited me as well. Yeah. Uh, and with Kemp, I think the interesting thing I was saying about uh, Cradle to Grave biopics, uh, two of the figures in your film actually do have Cradle to Grave biopics. So did you sort of see like your film as a departure or a different side or really uh, focusing in on this moment uh, shows us an aspect of Malcolm, of uh, Cassius that we really didn't get to see when a film was trying to like jam their history into two hours? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't see One Night in Miami as a biopic at all. Um, right. I just, I just wanted to have a conversation um, with um, a conversation with four men um, that I considered heroes for, for very different reasons, but it's also a very common conversation. It's a conversation, you know, you almost take for granted. It's a conversation that I have been having with my boys since we were teenagers. Uh, it's a conversation that goes back to to Booker T and WEB, it's this like, <laughs> what's the best way forward for black people in this country? Um, right. And I just thought that these four real men and the fact that they were friends, um, really there was a, it was wonderful that they also represented, at least in my view, very different ideas of moving the needle forward. Um, and and, I, and it, for me, it was a wonderful opportunity. I, I, I always pitched it as, you know, the boxing match in, in a room. It's, it's an intellectual boxing match. I just wanted to see this um, battle of ideas between friends that no matter how heated things got at the end of the day, they still had love, they were still brothers and they still wanted the same things. I wanted to actually have the kind of disagreement that um, I think at times we feel like we're not allowed to have, have it between, between these men. So I, I didn't really feel that much pressure because I, I've always said that I'm a former journalist and, and I, I've always said I've never professed to know the most about any of these four men. I know a lot about them because I've read the same bios as everyone, but I'm, I'm also Generation X. You know, there's this generation above me that literally knew all these men <laughs> and kicked it with them. So, so, you know, I'm not trying to say that, that, I, that I know more about Brother Malcolm or know more about Jim. Jim's still alive. Uh, for, and, and so that, that was never really the point to, to do a biopic. It was just using this very, very, I thought it was a crucible moment that year in all four of the men's lives. Um, in that crucible moment, um, within, a, within a year of that very real night, two of them were going to be dead. Um, and I just think the facts of all of their lives lent themselves to me focusing on this moment to just have this conversation. Right. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm so lucky to be speaking to people who not only have a knowledge of screenwriting, but have a vast knowledge of theater. Uh, so that being said, do you think it's important for emerging Black screenwriters to develop a knowledge of the work of Black playwrights? Uh, how did theater help bring you to and prepare you for filmmaking in screenwriting? Uh, you, you, theater, theater is it's it uh, theater is life. It's 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 in in my experience, and it's just my experience as a as a black woman, kind of marching her way forward in this in these various fields. Theater's life, and and what I've learned from theater is how to work independently, and how to work well with others. I mean, plays well with others could be one of the things that's written on my headstone or, you know, in the field where I lay, you know, I mean, plays well with others. And I think that's, that's very important um, to learn. Uh, I, I teach at NYU and I teach dramatic writing, but it's, it's all kinds of dramatic writing. I, I think playwriting is very, very important um, to learn, but as, as well as, you know, we should also learn how to write for film too. We should learn everything. We should also play instruments. So I'm gonna plug my little thing here. Um, if you don't play an instrument, Ruben, I know you play the harp, the harp. I know you play harmonica, right? I mean, we should all at least play one, one instrument. Even if we don't do it brilliantly, we don't have to be, you know, Winton or what have you, you know? Um, I think that's really important for uh, us as a tribe. 
right. I, think, I know, just went off on a tangent. Sorry, but no, I love it. I, I think you know we don't just need, you know, we need to know black stories. We need to know black history. We need to know black life, and we need to know that black life is worthy of storytelling. It's worthy of sharing with the world. It is. It is a beautiful thing. It's a different thing. African American people, people who are in this country, we are new people. We ain't been here before, honey. Yeah, this mm -hmm. mixture here that we are. You know, <laughs> it was snatched from here and pulled here and thrown here. So it's, it, but what we have contributed to the world is, is unparalleled. Right. You know, we can't and, say we're, uh, all, what do you say? No, I was just gonna say, and right, what we have contributed to the world is unparalleled. And those who try to tell us differently, sit See, down. Yeah, you because sit down. we can't, Sorry, it's I'm like, yeah. I was talking to my cousin the other day, I'm trying to find out where my where my great grandfather's from. You know, I tried to this, mm -hmm. this, this, and then they said, well, Mackenzie, Alabama, ain't no ports in Mackenzie, Alabama. Where did they come in from and get to Mackenzie, Alabama? Well, you know, grandma was Cherokee and she was, with, and I was like, I'm trying to figure, but what we have contributed in jazz and blues and music and art and painting and theater, theater is incredible for a writer because it gives you a clear voice. Right. Film is, is information coming from a lot of places when you're trying to have your clarity of the story you're telling. You got, and if you're lucky, if you got producers in the room that get you, you're lucky. Because sometimes I'm writing a movie about 1974 and a woman brought in a song from 1979. It has to be in the movie. I'm like, that was, the movie's 1974. That didn't start, that song is from 79. How do you know this? Cause I know, I know the research. In 74, I was in high school listening right. to music. Set by 78, I was in you know, 676, I was a disc jockey. I mm -hmm. know what music did, you know, woman, you just graduated from MIT. Anyway, I don't want to get on this tangent. Calm down, Ruben. So we need to know <laughs> our history so we can share this incredible, this journey. I ain't talking about the woe is me. Somebody gave me something about two weeks ago and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. It's going to start on a slave plantation. I said, I don't mind slave plantation. We, that's a victory. We won that. Y'all couldn't destroy us, we, you know, look, look, look at us. But mm -hmm. I ain't going there. I'm not starting this on a slave plantation. It's been done. I said, how am I going to go on a slave plantation a hundred times and ain't done the Harlem Renaissance once? Mm -hmm. I said, I mean, real, like roots, like five episodes, you mm -hmm. know, but this genius, that genius, hit, let me hit the Harlem Renaissance. Anyway, <laughs> learn our, our stories so we can reveal them. In, in, in August Wilson said something one day, he said, my job as a writer is to take the finest material and make the proper angel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that, mm -hmm. you know, so, so we, we are things of, we are fine, you know, anyway, go ahead, y'all. I mean, wow. Yeah, uh, I think that definitely gets me into my next question mm -hmm. uh, in sort of thinking about it as a final question. Uh, what's next for depictions of Black history? How can we push further? And are there moments to scale back from or rethink how we show them? I mean, I think, I hope that I can't tell. Right. My hope is that I have no idea. Um, you know, my hope is that it isn't um, facsimiles of work that we've done or, you know, or, things, or stories we, we've exp explored because you know, I, I know that that's sort of how things tend to work in Hollywood. You know, if something's successful, how mm -hmm. can we do it again? Um, and I hope that, you know, I think that what makes the reason why, you know, to go back to the point I made earlier, like, I, I don't want them to alley Sean our, our movies, you know? Right. Um, everyone is very specific and different. And that I think is, that to me is what makes this year special. Um, not their existence, but the fact that they're so vast. Uh, and so what I hope is that, you know, there's more, yes, uh, on the heels of this year, but that they're as just continue to get more expansive and unique. And, you know, that as much of the sport, as much as I was able to sort of revel in the sport of, you know, making this kind of movie in this vessel, it would be great to get to a place where there's no need for that. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, you could just make a traditional suit to nuts biopic if you so choose. Um, so. Yeah, I wanted to throw it to you, Kemp, too, just thinking about the two movies you had this year. 
how different and innovative they were, of course, One Night in Miami and then also Seoul. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we still have a lot of catching up to do. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we really, we really do. I mean, there's so, going back to your earlier question about theater, um, mm. the reason why I love theater so much is because it allows us to get to each humanity in a different way, unlike anything else that, I, that I've seen. Um, if, if there's another way to get to the essence of humanity, um, I, I haven't seen it. Um, and that's why mm. theater is always going to be my my first love like the first thing that I did after both these films came out was finish off another play because and and I remember like screening <laughs> it, it was recorded and and I got a few friends who like watched the stream and they they were just not ready for the level of raw emotion that like I put into this stage piece that I realized like this can't work as a like there's things you can do on stage I just think you can't do it anywhere else like stage has the ability um, uh, just using, uh, I mean, both Susan Laurie's Top Dog, Underdog, that's one of the, the, the moments where I'm sitting in a theater and watching these productions are seminal moments in my life. Um, August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. When Harold Loomis does his monologue at the end, I'm almost embarrassed being in the audience because I get so viscerally upset that I shake. You know what I mean? Because it captures this kind, it captures a rage in a way that I can't articulate it. You know, like I don't have the words to articulate the feelings that a Harold Loomis, and anyone who's listening, you should go both read Top Dog, Underdog and Joe Turner's Come and Gone Tomorrow. You know, like it's important to, to cause, and it's on the page. Like I can read these plays and find myself shaking and quaking. Um, and, and I just want to have an opportunity to bring that level of emotion to my screenplays. And that's all I was really trying to do. I mean, in the case of, like I said, One Night in Miami, I was trying to have a conversation. And in the case of Soul, um, the, me and, and Pete and Mike were trying to tell this universal human tale through the, specifically through the prism of a black man's life. Um, and, and those are things that I, don't, I didn't expect to ever get to do um, in cinema, and I hope there are more opportunities to do it. But the guide to how to do it is the stage, <laughs> in, in, in my opinion, it really is. Right. Because theater is the only place they're going to let us be whole, unadulterated, without any. You know, it's pure. It's the pure funk. It's the p funk. It's like you can actually be as angry, as happy, as passionate as I just was. You could tell I'm a theater actor because I get passionate and it start pouring out. You know, and it's like, I can do that on stage in a safe place. No police are gonna shoot me in the head. Nobody's gonna take me down. I've lost my mind. I can be as, I can be as vulnerable, as weak, as powerful, as ugly, as romantic as I want. And no one is filtering it. Yeah. No one is saying, you can't do that. And that's why I've spent the last damn near 50 years of my life in the theater. Yeah. You know, and I love, I need Hollywood and I need my movies and I need my TV because, you know, any, any art needs something to pay for it. And that has been granted me a wonderful life to pay for, for this art that I want to do. Now the wonderful revelation is I'm, I'm trying to find art now in film and they do it in Europe all the time. Mm -hmm. You can watch a European film and it'd be like art. You know what I'm saying? But we like, get to a quick, get to a quick, instant, instant, instant. Where's the action? Where's the conflict? You know, they don't let it develop. In theater, we let it develop. Right. And then Susan, are you? You were right. I was just like, I would ask, um, I mean, I would hope going forward, and, and thanks, Kemp, for mentioning Top Dog Underdog. I, I would hope going forward that we, as a tribe, are more supportive of each other. I'm just gonna say that because, you know, like in Judas and the Black Messiah, like in United States versus Billy Holiday, the, 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 uh, where Jimmy Fletcher is an agent of the US government where she falls in love with Jimmy Fletcher and that love that Billy has for Jimmy is like the way we love our country and it don't love us back. I would hope that we as a group, as a tribe can be more supportive of each other because when we say, I mean, there are black police Okay, and I, I mean, or maybe just in my experience, but I have experienced censorship, even in the theater. You shouldn't be saying that. 
Even with Top Dog Gutter Dog, people come, you shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be saying that about us. So I would hope that we can, we can allow each other to, to develop fully as, as, as people. Cause some of the biggest gatekeepers look like us. Mm. And I'm just gonna, say, you know, uh -oh, you know, but but I that's where I experience the most harm uh, when I am when I am uh, taken down by a sister or a brother, because um, I got my I got my tools for the other, you know what I mean, for the man and them and yeah. But when it, my sister or brother comes at me, uh, I, I, yeah, I would hope that we can just we can just let down those 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 swords and shields, which is why I just love looking at you guys today. And while looking, seeing your faces and feeling your, your power and your brilliance makes me just f feel great about this, this field I'm working in. It really, really does. It fills me with joy and love. I think that's we'll a beautiful, thought-provoking moment to end it on. Uh, that is all the time we have. This has been the Awardist History Makers panel. Thank you to Shaka King, Susan Lori Parks, Kemp Powers, and Ruben Santiago Hudson. Go see Judas in the Black Messiah, The United States versus Billie Holiday, One Night in Miami, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom if you haven't already. Thanks again.